redox reactions also known as reduction oxidation reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. These reactions are motivated by the exchange of electrons from one species to another. Now I don't mean that a squirrel gives its electrons to another squirrel, although if you imagine one squirrel giving its acorns to a different squirrel, then you got the right idea. In a redox reaction, one species gives its electrons to another species. For example, a metal will give its electrons to a nonmetal. When this happens, the metal becomes positively charged and the nonmetal becomes negatively charged. Of course, forming an ionic bond would be considered a redox reaction. Becoming more positive in charge, it's called oxidation. Becoming more negative in charge, that's called reduction, because the charge is reduced to a negative value. There are three basic kinds of redox reactions, and I'm going to demonstrate each of them for you in turn today. In a synthesis reaction, two elements come together to form a compound. Typically, you're talking about a metal and nonmetal coming together in such a way that they form an ionic bond, where the metal undergoes oxidation as it becomes more positive in charge by losing electrons and the nonmetal becomes more negative in charge by gaining electrons called reduction. There are very few metals that are found on our planet in their pure state. And the reason is there's a lot of oxygen in our atmosphere. And oxygen is a strong oxidizing agent. It's very good at taking electrons away from metals. When a metal reacts with oxygen, it forms that metal oxide. So when magnesium reacts with oxygen, you get magnesium oxide. And when copper reacts with oxygen, you get copper two oxide. Of course, it's necessary to balance the reaction. Elements by themselves have no charge, so the magnesium loses electrons, is oxidized. The oxygen gains electrons, is reduced. The magnesium gives its electrons to the oxygen. Same thing happens with the copper. The copper's charge becomes more positive by losing electrons. The oxygen becomes more negative by gaining those electrons. That's where redox comes in. Now, as you're about to see, these two reactions do not proceed with the same amount of vigor. Each of them gives off a certain amount of energy when they react, and you'll be able to tell pretty clearly which one gives off more energy than the other. Okay, first we're going to react the copper with the oxygen by heating it up in a Bunsen burner flame. As it heats up, you can see how it glows. When we're done, you can see that what was once copper colored is now sort of a silvery gray color. This is the copper two oxide that we just formed in the heat of the Bunsen burner flame. The copper was oxidized, the oxygen from the atmosphere was reduced, leading to copper two oxide. Now we're going to try magnesium and oxygen. The difference here is that magnesium is a group 2 element, and group 2 elements are fairly reactive. Did copper do this? You can actually see the white smoke of magnesium oxide being given off at the top. This white stuff that remains is magnesium oxide. You'll notice that this reaction was a lot more exothermic than the one with copper. Now, of course, when we take this magnesium oxide and try to react it further, you'll notice that it doesn't react at all. Magnesium oxide is stable. Magnesium's got a stable octet. The oxygen's got a stable octet. Therefore, it has no further reason to react. The energy that we just added was your ionization energy, the energy it takes to kick those electrons out of the magnesium so that oxygen can gain them. If you can put two things together, then you can break them back apart again. We call that decomposition, where a compound breaks up to form its original elements. To break up an ionic bond, you have to take away the electrons from the nonmetal stable octet and give them back to the metal. Now, the metal doesn't want to gain them, the nonmetal doesn't want to lose them. So, decomposition generally does not happen on its own in nature. You need to add quite a bit of energy to make it happen. The H charge becomes more negative, goes down, it's reduced. B's charge goes more positive, its negative charge goes up to zero. Now in order to form a negative ion, 
the nonmetal had to gain enough valence electrons to make a stable octet. So basically what you're doing is you're taking those electrons away from the nonmetal and giving them back to the metal that gave them up to begin with. Most of these reactions can't be carried out at room temperature, but I'm going to show you one that can be. This is the peroxide ion. It's two oxygens bonded together in such a way that their total charge is minus two. Now normally, when oxygen bonds with another oxygen, it's going to share this pair of electrons and it's going to share this pair of electrons to form a double bond. But in the peroxide ion, what happens is these two electrons are shared so that you look, it looks like this. But that leaves an unpaired electron in each of these oxygens, which gains an electron from another element. This oxygen gains another element's electron. This oxygen gains another element's electron, and the whole thing has a charge of minus two because it's got two extra electrons in its structure. This peroxide ion can coordinate covalent bond with a whole bunch of things, including hydrogen, to make a molecule we call hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Now peroxides are extremely unstable. Oxygen does not want to be in this situation. It achieves a lower energy state when it's double bonded instead of single bonded. So anytime you've got a peroxide molecule, it's going to want to do whatever it can to break that bond and make the oxygens double bonded to each other. Peroxide compounds are highly unstable. When heat or catalyst is added to hydrogen peroxide, it decomposes. This oxygen goes away and this hydrogen takes its place. This oxygen goes away, and this hydrogen takes its place. So what you end up with are two molecules of water and one molecule, diatomic molecule, of oxygen. Each hydrogen's charge is plus one. Each oxygen's charge is minus one. Now I know that the only charge for oxygen that's on the periodic table is minus two, but in the peroxide ion, each oxygen's got a minus one charge. Hydrogen remains plus one, this oxygen is minus two, this oxygen is zero. So in this particular redox reaction, oxygen is both oxidized and reduced. One of the oxygens undergoes oxidation and the other oxygen undergoes reduction. This is actually not all that uncommon. Here's your hydrogen peroxide. We're going to decompose it by adding a catalyst. The catalyst we're going to use is manganese dioxide. We're going to test for the presence of oxygen gas by doing the glowing splint test. I'm going to take this wooden splint, light it on fire, blow it out, and then I'm going to take that glowing splint, put it in here. Now, if it just continues to be out, there's carbon dioxide in there. If it explodes, it's hydrogen. On the other hand, if it catches fire again, that's because there's an excess of oxygen. That oxygen reignites the flame. Those are your three classic flame tests. Here goes the catalyst. Well, some kind of gas is being formed. It's forcing all this upwards. What gas is it? The glowing split test shows us pretty definitively that it's oxygen. In a single replacement reaction, an active element replaces a less active element that's already bonded in a compound. A more active metal will replace a less active metal. A more active nonmetal will replace a less active nonmetal. You can tell which metal or nonmetal is more reactive by going to reference table J. Reference table J lists metals from most active to least active and nonmetals from most active to least active. So any active metal can replace a less active metal that's sitting there in a compound. According to reference table J, magnesium is a much more active metal than copper is. So magnesium should be able to replace copper in a compound. But copper should not be able to replace magnesium in a compound. Only one of these two reactions should take place. 
According to reference table J, it's magnesium that should be able to replace copper. Copper doesn't have enough oomph to take magnesium's place. Magnesium should replace copper. Now let's actually try that. In the first spot, I'll put copper. In the second spot, I'll put magnesium. First, I will add magnesium nitrate to the copper. And now, and now I'll add copper nitrate to the magnesium. And you can see very clearly at this point that even the time has passed, the copper hasn't reacted at all, but the zinc has reacted like crazy. So it looks like magnesium can replace copper, and copper cannot replace magnesium. So what's happening in this reaction? Well, magnesium starts off with a charge of zero, ends up as plus two. It's undergoing oxidation because it's losing electrons, two electrons to be specific, per mole. Copper starts off as plus two, ends up as zero. Its charge is being reduced down to a more negative value, it undergoes reduction. So the magnesium gives up electrons to the copper. And the sulfate, well, it just sits there not doing anything. It just sits on its big, fat, pimply butt watching the action go down. That's right, it's a spectator ion. Doesn't contribute in any way to the reaction. This could have just as easily been copper 2 nitrate or copper 2, any kind of soluble copper 2 compound. The negative ion doesn't matter, spectator ion. Now according to reference table J, zinc is more active than hydrogen. Any metal that's more active than hydrogen can be eaten away by an acid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some zinc and react it with some hydrochloric acid. Let's see what it makes. So the zinc gets put into this Erlenmeyer flask and then we add some hydrochloric acid. I'm going to let the hydrogen fill this up so that it displaces any air out from this flask and then cap it up and the hydrogen has nowhere to go but into this balloon. Okay, the balloon is now big enough. I will untie it and let it float up to the ceiling. Okay, so what's in that balloon? Now you might think it's helium, but you'd be wrong. Because as you know, helium floats, but you can't make helium without helium. And of course, helium, being a noble gas, you can't make it in a chemical reaction. But no, that the zinc is going to replace the hydrogen. So you'll get zinc chloride, And you're going to get what? Oh yeah, hydrogen. And I'm going to prove to you it's hydrogen right now. I'm going to prove to you that this is not helium. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of crying babies all over the world. I'm going to introduce a flame to the balloon. Flame, meet balloon. Zinc starts off in a zero charge, ends up as plus two. That means it underwent oxidation. The hydrogen started as plus one, ended up by itself as zero. It underwent reduction. And the chloride ion just sat on its big fat pimply butt as a spectator ion. So the zinc gave up its electrons to the hydrogen. And of course, hydrogen being group one element doesn't like to exist by itself in nature. So at the first opportunity, it's gonna bond to whatever it can. 
since there's plenty of oxygen around for it to bond to, there you go. So that's redox reactions.